Well, thank you so much for joining me, Frank. It's good to have you. It is great to be here. I appreciate the opportunity. Great. Now, uh, to get the house and cl um, cleaning items before we go, Ed, um, you wanted to give us a disclaimer about your work. Yeah, of course. So data science, data and analytics are my passion. Uh, I do work for a big retailer in the US, but I would love to start out by saying all the views that I am about to talk about are my own uh, and not the, the views of my um, employer. Great. So that out of the way, um, let's kick off with um, the kind of industry you work in. Uh, one of the greatest um, gains that can be made um, through AI and data science is probably in logistic and supply chain, because that's where the most of the money is. Um, each year um, from Shanghai alone, there are 300,000 containers that move around the world um, supplying items for the um, people who actually need it and making international trade possible. Um, in US alone, there's 100 billion um, in annual sales um, that rely on um, the efficacy of supply chain. Walk us through how um, you apply data science principles in a supply chain and uh, what kind of value it creates. Sure. So for for about a decade now, I have been building and leading data analytics teams that leverage data science techniques to try to better understand logistics and supply chain uh, and the trade-off between performance, cost, and speed. Now, in my experience, supply chain is a little bit different than internet businesses in that there are a lot of different systems that are trying to talk to each other. So if you're thinking about how the world works at uh, Google or Facebook, or let's say even Amazon, uh, where it's more of a closed system, my experience in supply chain is that you have all these different systems that are collecting data and trying to put it together in a way to make sense so that you can track inventory and track products across your supply chain as they get handed off from node to node. Uh, and transportation partner to transportation partner. That becomes really challenging trying to put all that together. And it becomes even more challenging when you try to do it at scale. So my team is my my team and my teams over the past few years have spent a lot of time putting that information together in the right way so that you can take insights out of it. So it always starts with visibility. Can we see where our inventory is moving and if it's moving at the speed that we expected. So at each node of a supply chain, you have, did I reach this, this place by the expected time? Uh, and you measure the service level, as well as are things moving at the speed you thought? Often what you'll find is they're not. A lot of the time you get these kinks in your supply chain, you get these bottlenecks in your supply chain. And really it's a matter of being able to identify when they are happening and why they are happening. Uh, and if you are really, really good, trying to predict that in advance, even before it happens, so you can prevent the bottleneck from, from even occurring in the first place. Well, we're definitely going to be talking some of the epic failures um, of supply chain, <laughs> but you know, um, let's uh, open up a discussion a little bit more uh, talking about um, how the horizontal and vertical integration of supply chain actually helps and makes the job harder at the same time. For example, for Amazon, um, and Walmart, a lot of their fulfillment centers um, and their distribution centers are in their own control. So they own the whole supply chain. They have their own employees and they have their own fleet system. For some of the others, that might not be true. For example, um, Target, they have to deal a lot with FedEx, uh, UPS, uh, USPS, um, and other companies um, and you know make a coordination schedule um, in which um, they have to rely on other people as um, stakeholders. So is that beneficial in some ways or how hard is that to actually uh, predict uh, these kind of emotions? It is, in my mind, you think about it in terms of, you mentioned Amazon as a more closed system and then <laughs> most other supply, chain is supply chains as open systems. So trying to coordinate the behaviors of all those different agents becomes really hard. So even when you have all of the data and the data is flowing and you can make sense of it, trying to take that and coordinate the different agents or the different players to the behavior that you're trying to achieve is, is probably the biggest challenge of them all. Right, so there's the data challenge to start with, and then there's getting your carriers or getting the people that are working in the distribution center to change the inertia of, of how they're working. 
because you can imagine uh, a lot of supply chains are either locally managed or centrally managed, or there's a hybrid combination of both. And if the central node wants to say, we need, we have identified this problem in our supply chain, or we have identified where this bottleneck is happening with the data, even when you can, can find that, really communicating the message downstream to all the different local parts of your supply chain and saying, hey, you need to change your pickup routing to work a little bit differently. Um, if you have control over the whole system, it's a bit easier. If you don't have control over the whole system, you have to figure out ways to incentivize or disincentivize behaviors to try to align to that uh, initial goal. And how do you do that incentivizing? Uh, so it, in over the past 10 years, in my experience, a lot of it is building trust and partnerships before those problems occur. And if you don't have the trust and partnership before, the conversation at the time of crisis becomes even, even harder. So I find, uh, I have found, or I've seen that if you are more open with sharing your insights, sharing your information, sharing your data to a certain extent, right? You don't want to be completely open book. And there's, there's reasons for that, that different organizations will have, but the more information you can share and the more you can be open with the different goals, right? Uh, the partners that I work with externally, I, I try to help them understand what our end goal is. And I try to understand what their end goal is. If we can build that partnership and that trust, when the crises hit, it becomes a little bit easier to navigate because you've built relationships. And then there's always a little bit of give and take at the, at the time. If every single agent in your supply chain is maximizing for their own good, you're just going to have gridlock. You're, no one's going to achieve what they, they want to achieve. One of the things I've thought about recently, particularly over the past two years, as uh, the ports in the US have, have backed up and become backlogged and bottlenecked as we try to bring a lot of imports into the country, is the inability of different agents to understand what, what each other are doing, right? So you have all these companies that are trying to import all this product and it's trying to come through the ports at the same time. And I started thinking about the idea of prediction markets and prediction markets have been gaining traction over the past, um, past few years, uh, particularly political prediction markets. But it made me wonder if there was prediction markets for supply chain and predictions for prediction markets for logistics. Would it be possible to incentivize all of those different agents with all of that siloed information to start putting to, to start making predictions on where we are going to have bottlenecks? And if you could harness that wisdom of the crowds, wouldn't it be really interesting for importers who are trying to bring all that product in at the same time to identify that ahead of time and then start to proactively make moves around those bottlenecks in turn? relieving those bottlenecks. That's, that's one of the things I've been thinking about. How do you share information without really sharing information um, to make the whole whole macro system work a little bit more fluidly? And we just need witness. I'm, I'm glad you brought this up. Um, we recently had this um, epic failure of uh, global transportation at Suez Canal where you know it, the traffic was stuck for what three, four days. Um, and I'm just wondering uh, how did it actually impact the sales um, and uh, fulfillment um, at Target um, or um, generally in the market uh, where these bottlenecks can result in pretty drastic um, losses. And I, I guess um, on some level, you're talking about the same thing that, you know, if, if we are able to predict um, these um, bottlenecks um, ahead, um, what would be the way that we could actually do that? And what, what are generally the impacts that you have seen um, when these bottlenecks do happen? Yeah, good question. So every retailer, depending upon their strategy, is going to handle it a little bit differently. But general principle in logistics is if you are planning ahead, you want to create, you want to put some kind of buffer uh, on your lead times. So if you think that it's going to take your product three weeks to get from order all the way to the shelves of, uh, of either your distribution centers or your stores, if you plan three weeks, you probably want to go a little bit longer on that, right? So instead of three weeks, let's say you, you plan for four weeks um, so that when you're, there's a backup at ports around the globe or in, in one of the, the canals throughout the world, you have that stock that is able to be purchased 
um, without losing sales. Um, but at the same time, there's a balance, right? Because you don't want to put too much buffer on that lead time because you don't want to carry too much inventory at the same time because you'll you'll tie up uh, capital. So you got to figure out what the balance is. In times of high volatility, it's probably a good idea to put a little more buffer on. When things are, um, let's say, rolling along and global supply chains are uh, in, a, in, in an optimal state where if product is flowing, you can take a little bit of that buffer off. I was just wondering, how do you hedge some of the risk by actually pinpointing the product lines that would be better not to buffer in the other product that which would be, for example, if you're looking at the perishable items, that's probably not a good idea to, you know, um, hold it for a longer time in comparison to the other items that you would know, you know, eventually will um, sell out. Um, so do you also have a mechanism that defines different product classes um, and, you know, what would be different inventory levels for them should be? Sure. So depending upon the profitability of any item, there should be tiers and categories in times of crises where the supply chain is moving in a way that right, it wasn't predicted. Uh, you want to be able to identify very quickly. And this is where the power of having data at your disposal of where's all the items in my network? What is the profitability of those items? If I have to either make items move faster by, let's say, putting them on a plane, can I do it? If I don't know where those items are, and I don't know what the level of stock is, I, I have no chance, right? At least if you have this ability to where they are and you've built a good data ecosystem, uh, you, can, I, you can create tiers and sub-tiers of those products to say, hey, these are the stuff that we need to have on, on the shelves, either at a DC or the store, um, and then be able to move those more quickly. Of course, it comes back to the trade-off of speed, cost, service level, right? When you're trying to move that stuff, you're going to have to, probably most likely pay, pay more money, um, pay more money for the speed. And then hopefully your, your service level maintains where it is. So you can figure out not instantaneously, but pretty quickly profitability versus the increased cost and then pull the trigger on it. Cause in supply chain, right. Considering how, um, considering how precise supply chains are today, the timing becomes very important. Because if you could run out of inventory in two to three days and then you're losing sales, that's, uh, that's going to be a, a bigger cost than the cost of incurring the expedite. You know, one of the important decisions actually in logistic is, and I'm kind of curious about this, is um, when you immediately want um, products uh, and you don't want any delays, you, can, you have a choice between um, air freight um, or the ocean freight. Um, and uh, that's a hard thing to make depending on the profitability um, of the products that you're uh, going to be selling. And I was just wondering, is that a way to, uh, for example, for air freight, you know, um, the locations of airplanes, but is, do you also have a system for um, shipments through the ocean uh, where you can actually pinpoint um, ship at a certain location or if there's a problem or anything at all? Look, in a, in a super ideal world, you would be able to put RFID on everything. Every item would be tagged with RFID and you'd be able, every single plane that it got on or every ship that it got on or a container that an item went into, we would be able to track all that stuff and there would be perfect visibility. <laughs> In reality, we don't have that. We're not necessarily close to it. And the real problem is that there's, there's some standardization um, with all the, the systems in the supply chain world. But again, it's not perfect. And when you are in crisis mode or trying to switch gear or um, trying to find capacity, perhaps with a, a carrier that you haven't worked with before, you're going to be pro perhaps trying to pull data from a new system. System integrations do not happen overnight. Um, if you're lucky, in a few weeks, you can, right, any company could integrate with a, a new 3PL, and then you can have data flowing. But, but what happens really is that this stuff becomes very manual in a time where you need to go very fast, right? If you are foreseeing that you're going to lose sales, you need to go fast, you need to find new capacity, which means you work with new carriers, whether you're putting it onto a, a different ship, or whether you're putting it on an airplane, you're probably going to be looking at a new data feed, hopefully. Um, and the timeliness of that is, it, it could be when the ship 
departs, you get data, or it could be when the airplane departs, you get data, or it could be not till right your, your package or your PO or anything gets to its destination, and then you get data. And the way you get that might not even be as systematically as you want it to be. Right? It could be someone going into a spreadsheet and typing the number, yep, receive this. It was probably at these other points in the supply chain at this date. And then you get that data. It may look like, quote unquote, data to you, because I, I mean, it is data, right? But the way you get it makes the precision of it um, not, as, not as great as uh, that ideal world that I started describing in the beginning. It's really interesting, actually, if, if you have such a garbled data um, by inconsistent feed and, you know, uh, not putting the data in the right manner, uh, which is consistent, that creates a huge problem for you, no? Um, you know, you don't know how to clean the data, you don't know how to put that in system, you don't know how to make forecast based on that data. And in the end, you know, everyone's going to be pulling gun on your head because you didn't predict the things right and, you know, your job's on the line. Don't you think it's kind of a moving target here? Look, every experience that I've had and everywhere that I've worked has been in a similar state. Um, there is, this real need to understand not only the data and the data methodologies and the algorithms that you're trying to work with, but also how the business operates. The data scientists and, and, and the data analysts that work in this domain really need to be able to think about the business and see a distribution and think almost immediately, that doesn't make sense. I have this prior expectation of what the distribution looks like and Honestly, a lot of the time we think we need to look at the data first and let the data tell us what's happening here. But with the piecemeal information that's coming to us and all these different systems feeding us this information in different ways, I think it's equally as important for data scientists and data analysts in this business to know how supply chain and logistics works and what is really going on out there when the data is collected. Because once they have that vision, they can gain some intuition to say, man, that those dates don't look right. Or it's, that, that's a really funky distribution. I'm gonna dig more into that and understand how this data was created. Um, and I, I find in the supply chain logistics world, I'm sure it exists in, in other industries as well, but that is, almost, I'm not going to say uh, entirely the norm, but it's more of the norm than you might ex expect from other industries. I mean, data science is a very interesting field in the sense that, you know, you're kind of on the chopping block and sandwich between the management and, and the line workers where you have to, you know, make sense of the data that's simply not there. And even if you have an intuition, it's just an intuition, you can back it up with the numbers, but if it doesn't come true, then, you know, um, the C-suite is going to come yelling at you. And in your position, um, I can, the only metaphor that I can think of is, you know, Neo dodging the bullets in metrics, uh, where you have to not only worry about labor, trucks, uh, weather, um, and supply chain issues, turnover, how do you actually manage all these balls and you know, juggle between um, these things? I mean, what are some of your tips to maintain your sanity as data scientists? I heard this really, really great quote yesterday. It was someone speaking and they said, data science is more about people than it is about data. And I find that in my space, that is utterly true. I find that step one for me is creating relationships and understanding what are the decisions and actions that my users are potentially gonna take, right? What are the things that are keeping them up at night? What are the, the first things that they're thinking about when they wake up in the morning? When you start with that, then you can start to back into what are the gaps that, that they really need to fill? And then from the other side, you can say, oh, I know these, these algorithms or these data science techniques that could help to fill those gaps. But time and time again, and I've been, been a guest on uh, this, this weekly meetup hosted by our studio. And every single week, it seems like the person being interviewed continues to go back to stakeholder partnership is, is so important in everything we do. And we have people that are coming from finance, from healthcare, from supply chain. And time and time again, it's really that human behavior aspect that if you don't start there, um, the data science communication part of it sometimes gets lost. And trust me, I understand that there are pure data science problems out there, right? I have this corpus of information. I need to use natural language processing to pull out 
this very specific level of information. In my experience, that is a, um, the people that get to work on those problems today are very, very lucky. Yeah, I think I've just had a, a podcast um, this last week with Walid Seba, who's probably a DB most leading expert in natural language understanding. And the um, benefits of natural language processing are quite limited in many uh, ways because it's for now, it's not smart at all. It's um, just a heuristical based um, search, which might not be very useful in many contexts. Uh, but let's talk a little bit about um, how do you manage um, different uh, stakeholders, for example, finance and HR. Um, one of the things that I really admire about your work, and I haven't literally seen this anywhere else, that you write a bi-weekly newsletter also, in which you reach out to all the stakeholders um, and you document your uh, work um, fantastically on your blog. You know, I've read uh, a lot of your blog posts and these are one of the uh, most valuable insights that I have, at least on supply chain and, and logistics. Tell us about um, how you build this communication um, and you know maintain this with all of the other workload that you have at um, the workplace. Yeah, of course. So this goes back, uh, my passion for newsletters goes back quite, quite a few years to when I worked in finance. I used to love getting up in the morning, grabbing a coffee, and then pulling up a few newsletters telling me about the markets. So I, I have a, a, a passion and a history of reading newsletters. And when I got into supply chain, I realized that the ability to flow information didn't always have to happen through email. And I thought I need to figure out a way to flow information to my stakeholders to give them different perspectives about our business and get them thinking in new ways. And I thought a newsletter was the one of the easiest ways to do that. So this is going five, six years back. I just started writing a newsletter wherever I was. Um, and internally at a company, I would write um, just my ideas on where the business was going, some of our core metrics, but then also look at externally because uh, a, in supply chain, a business can't necessarily only think about its internal supply chain. It's got to think about those external pressures as well. And I started putting all those all together and would write a newsletter every week. Um, and some weeks it's, it's two weeks. Uh, but I would formulate all of these ideas from my data science background and then all of the, the supply chain work we were doing, try to combine that into to a newsletter to send out to stakeholders. And I felt like that was the key way when it, for when I had an idea and I wanted to bring it to a stakeholder for them to say, oh, Frank, I've read some of your stuff in the past, or I've read some of the, the stuff that your team has done in your newsletter in the past. I'm going to sit here and listen to you intently for 15 minutes because I, I like that your ideas and the way you think. A lot of data scientists uh, I've heard, uh, they get a bit frustrated when they have these great ideas or they have this new clustering algorithm that they apply to the company's data. And then they go sit down with stakeholders and try to run through how the algorithm is working and what it looks like. And then the stakeholders are like, okay, great. So <laughs> let's call this, let's call this meeting over. Um, so for me, the newsletter was a way to really get buy-in from stakeholders and get them excited about, about a little more excited about their business um, and then how data can help them think about their business. I think it's very interesting, the convergence of both uh, ability to communicate um, and actually work on uh, mathematical, pro mathematical problems um, as a machine learning engineer. In my experience, it's been quite a challenge getting um, engineers to explain, like you just said, what they're doing to stakeholders in a language that they understand. So it's kind of like a French and Greek mix when it comes to um, the management and, and engineering. And I was just wondering, um, how did you actually develop uh, that communication? Especially one of the articles um, that you wrote on your blog really caught my eye, um, where you talk about a model why speed reading may enhance ideation and innovation. And I was just wondering, how does it actually, these, this reading idea can help engineers make themselves understood? Absolutely. Okay. So uh, one of the, the, core principles that I try to get all of my, my team members, not just that report to me, but team members around me to embrace is this idea that is not a secret of continuous learning. Uh, I'm always looking to be surrounded by intellectually curious people. And it's really because I, I think that the best solutions that we come up with aren't necessarily the ones where a stakeholder comes to us and says, I have this problem, can you help me solve it? And then, then 
we say, oh, this algorithm can solve that. We apply the algorithm and we give the solution. What I wholeheartedly believe is that the best solutions come from having a broader range of information at your disposal and then being able to connect a few different methodologies or ideas together to arrive to a solution that may not be the most novel thing in the world, but it is relatively different than uh, what most people are doing. The only way to get there is to really have a learning framework. This is in my experience and I've seen other people do it, but if you don't have a regimented learning framework, then it's very easy to say, I'm gonna leave that book over there, I'm never gonna read it. Or that podcast that I meant to listen to, I'm not gonna to listen to it. Or that, that online class, I'll get to it next month. But if every single day you decide that you're gonna do 15 to 20 minutes of structured learning, whether it's a class, whether it's a podcast, whether it's a book, if you can build that as a habit, you start to put these different ideas together. And then to the point of that blog post, what I was going for was, if you regularly do that, you have these different pieces of information that can relate to each other in different ways. When you relate information in your mind, and I think there's some research to back this up, when you can relate things together, you're more likely to remember them. If you're more likely to remember that stuff, it's you have a better chance of when your stakeholder is trying to solve a problem of coming up with that more novel solution. And do you think actually visualization help? Um, we had um, um, VP of Gartner, uh, Danny, on uh, my podcast, and he talked about the fact that for um, C-suite employees, they want to see the bigger picture, and, and visualizations actually drive point home a lot better than the simple data and, and the code itself. And I'm just wondering, uh, what do you use a target to make sure um, that you know your reports are uh, visualized in a sense that you know, it makes the bigger picture um, seem very obvious to a lot of people. So, and what do you actually use for that? Um, do you use Power BI, Tableau, or um, in-house built software? Um, how does it work? Yeah, good question. I, uh, I, I maybe have a little bit different view than, than most folks on this, but I think that aesthetics are incredibly important. So I think that if you can put in front of your partners or your stakeholders a table of data, that is really, let's say, beautiful and easy to read, and it makes total sense, and the color conditioning makes total sense, and you focus them into to the points that might matter in that table of data, that might be more effective than, let's say, a crappy bar chart, right, where the colors don't make sense, where the dates on the axis are all smushed together. So I think no matter how you're displaying your data, the aesthetics really matter, because you're going to get someone to look at it. And if it's, it's beautiful, they're going to look at it for another few seconds, just because it's pleasant to look at. If they look at it for another few seconds, they're more likely to pull out some insights. So I don't necessarily think it's a matter of it has to be a line chart, a pie chart, a bar chart, whatever your favorite visualization is. I just think that whatever you're putting in front of somebody, you should take the extra time to make it look really good. With that said, the... The places where I have worked over the, the years have a variety of mechanisms to visualize data. Uh, some places have, um, one, of the, one of the tools that I've seen used a lot is Domo. And Domo is a platform that brings together data from a bunch of different data sources and then gives you the ability to make these charts and do it in a, a, a real-time environment. Um, my current employer has, has their own in-house homegrown, you can think of it as a Tableau type system. Right, so any kind of user can make visualizations and with a bit of effort, make them look really good. My preference, I think, is building visualizations in R, uh, R Studio, and then ultimately in Shiny. I think that the amount of control that you have over the visualizations that you build, and again, you can make your visualizations look beautiful. So now you're bordering on the line of, right, am I making art or am I just making a, a an infographic to deliver information. I think those are concentric circles uh, and they're both important if you're trying to deliver a message. So over the past few years, when I'm delivering my own messages, I'm more inclined to uh, write an R script and then visualize my, my insights that way. And generally, do you have um, like in R Markdown, do you have a template report that uh, keeps um, updating itself uh, with the latest data? And then, you know, you just uh, share this report link with the 
um, decision makers, or do you have? Uh, I mean, you talk about one in one of your blog posts about uh, narrating the story as it comes, uh, not only the data, and, and that requires certainly um, explaining the new insight and why do you think um, the change is happening. And I was just wondering, do, do you have a template um, for the simplicity stake, or do you? Um, think about and write about um, the change in why it's happening and also in your newsletter. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things we try to steer clear of is PowerPoint decks because they are universal and in the right place in the right time, PowerPoint decks are great, but someone has to put together the deck, right? Which means cutting and pasting from here, putting it into a slide, new slide, writing some text on there. If you can have a platform where it is very easy, whether it's in our markdown, uh, which I've seen work very, very well, or it's a shiny dashboard where you can still do a little bit of manipulation, especially for the, the explanatory part, right? You can go in there and put, let's say, some text in there to say, oh, we saw a week over week spike in either a defect rate or a sales rate. If you can go in and, and ideally let users easily put in an explanation, that will work, um, I think, in the most powerful way. The, the trick is repeatability. Um, so it doesn't necessarily matter what the platform is, as long as you can have the data feed in and then refresh the visualizations and then be able to talk through it. Uh, that's, that's where I've seen the real time-saving value. Especially in your kind of business, uh, one of the um, important things about the data is that it's more likely to be um, a time series, um, which you have to forecast. And we have recently um, at our company um, for um, did a community project, which is the inflation rates throughout the world um, from 1960s and 2021, I guess. Um, and it was kind of an animation with um, racing bar charts. Um, and they, we use a tool called Flourish. And I was just wondering, do you also use a tool that animates the whole uh, process? Because a lot of people have, uh, talked about the visual appeal um, and the ease of understanding an animated um, visualization instead of a static one. For example, the, the matplotlib um, standard libraries is probably the ugliest visualization that I know of, it, and no one wants to see that. <laughs> um, you know, one of my favorite things, maybe period, my favorite things period is Hans Rosling and his TED Talks. And Haz Rosling, of course, made the tool Gapminder, where it is basically a scatter plot, but then the visualization, you can animate it. So over time, you're able to see how the scatter plot moves. So at the, at the country level, if you're looking at income and some kind of, let's say, uh, expect life expectancy, you can see the bubbles and then you can start in 1950. And then you can see the bubble for each country change over time and go up, up into the, to the upper right. And I saw Hans Rosling's TED Talks early on in, I'd say, my, my data science career, and it always has stuck with me. I would say today, we don't do a ton of animated visualizations, but I have been working on a talk for, there's a conference coming up in September called North, which is an R conference at the University of Minnesota. And I've been working on a uh, shiny application that will allow me to, as best as I can, replicate some of the energy that Hans brought to his TED Talks and his visualization. So the idea that you can ha have your narrative and you can be talking through your narrative, and then you bring up your line chart that originally starts blank. And then as you're talking through your narrative, over time, the line starts to grow and then you see a spike and then it comes down, right? And you could add the energy into the visualization. I think if you can achieve that, your stakeholders and your partners and your users are going to remember it for a long time. Yeah, I guess that's probably one of the differences between um, super famous TED Talks and not so super famous TED Talks. And, you know, <laughs> they captivate people with a lot of um, um, material that aids uh, what you're actually saying um, and a, a, apart from the music itself. But let's, um, you know, 
um, talk a little bit about uh, not your data science persona, but your uh, personal life persona. It's a very interesting uh, transition that you made from economics to data science. And one of the things that I really like about data science is that, you know, a lot of people are coming from different uh, subjects. It's a, such an interdisciplinary field that it doesn't restrict you to have a certain career path. Um, you cannot come from, uh, you cannot come in data science uh, from any other um, subject if you're not a computer science, scientist. And that's not how it works. Uh, for example, Andres and Karpati from Tesla, he, he was studying physics and you know, a lot of other people are coming from other backgrounds. And I'm just wondering what got you um, from economics uh, into data science. Your earlier um, jobs were also in um, economics um, in, and then you slightly moved uh, towards um, analytics and data science. Yeah, so it's a it, it's a pretty funny story actually. I I have a academic background in economics. Uh, I went to to university and got a bachelor's degree, followed by a master's degree, and then I got a job with Thomson Reuters. Uh, at the time, it was Reuters doing product development, so right in the financial services industry. And through working there, I had met. Uh, I'd been doing some right, working at Thompson Reuters and doing some consulting work all in that world. And at one point, somebody had asked me to do some consulting work where they asked me if I could do a little bit of economic modeling. And I said, I, I would love to try to do some economic modeling. And uh, right, a few questions later, they realized that I was not the guy. And it was one of those more embarrassing moments for me in my life thinking, great, I have a master's degree in economics and I can't do economics. How could this possibly be? So at the time I, um, I decided, okay, I'm going to turn this around. And I went home and got on my computer and I started Googling economics and coding because I was trying economics and programming to see, is there a way I could learn the, the whole coding world and the programming world, and then also learn what economic modeling is really all about. Because when, when I was in school at the time, we did econometrics and we did economic modeling, but it was proprietary software. And once I got out of school, I left that stuff behind. And if you don't touch it for three, four years, the thought process doesn't leave you, but the ability to implement it does. So through that, I found the R programming language and I took a course on the R programming language. Uh, and then I took a few more courses and then I just fell in love with it. And I went through uh, a course era specialization. Um, I believe it was called just data science at that point. And then after Coursera, I was on this, this learning frenzy. So then I found the company Udacity and I've done a bunch of their um, machine learning and data science nano degrees. And always in between, I've been taking different data science courses because I wanted to be, right? If someone ever approached me again and said, do you want to do some economic modeling? I wanted to be ready to, to take advantage of that opportunity. So it was a bit of embarrassment that led me to, to, to this world, uh, embarrassment, search, and then kind of falling in love with, with data and data science. My wish, you know, a lot of people would take their embarrassment so easy so that they would, you know, learn a lot of other things in the world. Um, but let's, um, you know, dwell a little bit about um, the education culture at university. Like you said yourself, that you learn econ econometrics and other um, tools, but you um, simply forgot it the moment you step out of the gate of the university. And I'm just mm -hmm. wondering, what does it actually say about our education system where people ought to know these tools that would um, enhance their knowledge and do something practical, but we don't do that. You know, a lot of data scientists and pretty much everyone that I know and have been, um, you know, I've, I've talked to them on my podcast, they have learned through data, uh, about data science through Udacity courses, Coursera um, and other platforms. And, and that's kind of a, a embarrassment for the universities where they're supposed to actually give cutting edge tools to people um, who would need that in their professional careers. And wh why do you think that happens? And what do you suggest um, universities should do to improve that situation? I will preface my answer with, I am no expert on this, <laughs> but, um, but I will say I went to university and I was a competitive runner there. And my athletic experience was unbelievable. And I met mentors and coaches in university that taught me life lessons that have lasted 
all throughout. So the lessons that my running coaches taught me at university, those were the lessons that I leveraged when I got embarrassed. And then I decided I'm going to figure out how to not be embarrassed like this again. All of the those training techniques and the, the life lessons that those coaches and mentors taught me when I was at university, they were immensely valuable. In terms of the economics education, there's a little, there's a little bit to be said about uh, my maturity level when I'm 18, 19 years old and going and sitting in classes and trying to listen to a lecture and lock this stuff in. I came out, so when I was, let's say in my mid twenties, I discovered Udacity and I did their data analyst nano degree program. And I think maybe even somewhere on my blog, I wrote it up and said, this was by far the best learning experience I have ever had. And I'm well aware that I think that the project-based curriculum that Udacity um, Udacity has with, with their programs and their students is very effective. So I think that the project-based learning is it works really well. But I also recognize that I was much more mature at 25 than I was at 19. So there is perhaps something to be said. It, it's not an overnight thing for the education system to change itself and then work wonders. Possibility that there is a lot of interaction variables happening, that the point of getting an education when you're 19, 20 years old might not exactly be aligned with how we're teaching in the university system. I guess let's give that question a different spin, which is yes. that um, now that you're a director um, and you're looking for these brilliant people, and you talk about that in some of your blog posts um, and your work where you're seeking people who have this intellectual curiosity and the mental astuteness um, to be able to figure out the patterns and then develop intuition. And that's a rare skill. I mean, that is exactly why data scientists um, command salaries three times above the um, national average. And to actually garner those skills and encourage people to develop those skills at university level, um, that's something you would, as an employer certainly want to see. And to be able to do that um, as um, an employer and not a university professor, what are the things that you would want them to have so that your job becomes easier and you don't have to train people for multiple years um, on um, job um, and you know people are ready or at least you know semi ready when they're um, reaching uh, workplaces? Yeah, so first of all, when I went to university and I wanted to study economics, it was because I wanted to go on Wall Street, work on Wall Street and make a lot of money, right? That, so initially that, that was the goal. Um, only years later did I realize that I really love the, the discipline of economics because it is about thinking in frameworks and incentives and stumbling upon Freakonomics and Steve Levitt and, and Russ Roberts and these different economists and economics is really about thinking, not necessarily about making a ton of money on Wall Street. I thought, man, if I would have known that when I was in college, I probably would have approached it a little bit differently. But there's probably this matching mechanism where young people go and decide they're going to study a certain discipline for a certain reason. And then it turns out that what that was a mismatch. There was not necessarily the right, the right path. Um, but in terms of uh, being someone in a hiring position, um, I, I think that intellectual curiosity is, it, it goes back to the learning framework. If you don't have the intellectual curiosity to say, why is that happening? Why is this happening? You're pretty much, it, it's going to be challenging, I think, to be really successful in the data science world, because you got to be utterly curious about the problems that you're trying to solve, but also the data science technology as it changes month to month because it is a rapidly expanding um, area. So I think the ability to keep asking why, and then to show that to other people, it's, it's, it's easy for anyone to say, oh yeah, I'm really curious. I'm intellectually curious. I read a book last year. Um, it's also, it, but then trying to, to prove that you have that curiosity and that fired you is a challenge. So my recommendation is always, tell me about the hardest thing that you worked on and the point where you were about to give up but then you kept going. 
if you can have right one of those examples in hand, I think that is useful. Um, and that really speaks to to to, to me um, one of those behaviors that I think is is really valuable when it comes to hiring data scientists. You know, a lot of people um, at my workplace, you know, they jokingly say that, you know, curiosity is a very nice euphemism for um, schizophrenic um, skepticism that data scientists actually harbor all the time. You know, they're never happy with the data. You know, they're always wanting more data and they're never sure about their recommendations as well. Uh, and to make a segue from this into one of the biggest problem um, at the moment in AI and data science, um, industries is how to build um, those data science teams. Um, because failure rate is through the roof. Um, and, and one of the articles in Forbes um, quoted a research uh, paper where 80, 80 to 85 percent of ML initiatives um, actually fail or never actually make it to production because of various um, causes. Um, and you talk um, a lot about um, how you envision a data science team to work together. Um, and so far, it's it's been very inspirational that not only on um, the technical side, um, you are doing uh, some great structural work, but also in terms of communicating that through biweekly newsletter. Um, that's certainly um, a new trend that a lot of uh, companies should adapt. But how do you actually tackle those problems um, of developing and maintaining efficient data science teams? There are a, a ton of opinions on this out there, and all I can do is garner my experience and, and continuously learn, uh, right, communicate what I've learned. So I think that balance across your team is, is very important. There are the core behaviors that I've been talking about, intellectual curiosity, extreme ownership, grit. But then at the same time, I think if you hire uh, a group of people who have a relatively similar data science skill set, let's say they're great with the sklearn Python library and they can all implement that really fast and do it well, you're going to run into to these challenges where data science, quote unquote data science, is a lot broader than just predictive modeling or, or just, um, yeah, creating, creating the predictive model part. I find, right, especially in my experience, the getting the data together and understanding the data in such a way that you can start to shape it and just aggregate it into like into these useful insights becomes step one. And then step two, right, let's go and, and create some more predictive models. In order to right, even start putting a team together, it is challenging to, as time goes by, find folks that complement each other on the team, especially when we want to be, um, right, if you are at an organization and you want to be consistent, consistent and fair in your hiring practices over time, it's hard to say that this time for this position, we need a data scientist that has these skills. The next time we need a data scientist with these skills, but you have to find that flexibility and you have to be comfortable to a certain extent with changing those expectations. Otherwise, you end up with an undiversified team with experiences and skills. And then you run into a point where nobody on your team wants to do this one piece of work. They'll begrudgingly do it. And as they begrudgingly do it, they'll also update their LinkedIn profile <laughs> and see what other opportunities are out there. So I'd say in terms of building and growing a team, Trying to get folks with different skill sets that complement each other are um, is is my my number one concern. Um, let's talk about um, things that happen in real life, uh, which creates a mess in a data scientist's life. Um, COVID nineteen was such a show. Uh, stopper for um, a lot of data scientists in the sense that the forecasting is no longer accurate. Um, profit models have gone down the drain and now it's a huge challenge what to do with the inventories, how much to order, uh, what will be the supply chain, uh, which um, store you should put on hold, uh, is the market going to go back on its previous levels or not? And that's a huge challenge um, which can probably decide the fate um, of any organization. How did you cope with this challenge and target? How, uh, I mean, generally speaking, how I think about that challenge is there are 
models where if you have relatively stable data over time, you can create great predictions and great outputs. If you don't have a stable environment, you wanna get a little bit more creative. The way I think about it is you wanna bring different perspectives to your stakeholders through different techniques. Uh, if I had to give it a name, I would call them insight pipelines, where you take one tech, you take your data, you run it through one technique, you get an insight out of it. You either take that insight, you run it through another technique, and then you get kind of step two in that, that data. I can give a very specific example. In operations, statistical control charts are often used to figure out when a process is going, what I say, off the rails. So over time, if you have a process and let's say the level is supposed to be 95%, right? So you're chugging along, chugging along, chugging along at 95% and starts to tick up to 95 and a half percent. And then right, it comes back down. You're gonna have some fluctuations around that average level over time. Now, what you wanna be looking out for is when you go from 95% to 95 and a half to 96 to 97, right? And you start to trend up and the control charts help you understand a normal volatility around that average. And we can calculate standard deviations around the average. So you go one standard deviation, two standard deviations up, three standard deviations up. So if your number goes from a regular 95 up to 99, you know there's something likely physically happening that we have to identify and correct. The process is off the rails. The challenge though, right? So anyone can do that and you can do that with, with a lot of different metrics. One of the biggest challenges is how much history do I use? So if I have time series of data, do I use the last five years of data? Do I use the last 10 years? Do I use the last six months? Because the last six months could be a totally different operating environment than the past, let's say three years. What I found really interesting was that if you take a time series, there are these algorithms called multiple change point algorithms. And these algorithms will look at the time series, look at the relative average level, as well as the variance around that level, and then break up your time series of data into discrete buckets. So if you have the past 10 years, it could say for the first three years, that was one bucket. The next two years is another bucket. And then the last five years is your third bucket. That five years is what you wanna to use to compare what's happening now. So you think about that pipeline, the first layer is take your time series, feed it to the change point algorithm, identify the current operating environment, which is that last piece, and then use that current operating environment to calculate your control charts and your control limits so that you can say, I looked at last week's numbers or I looked at yesterday's numbers. And you know what? We're a little bit elevated, but in this current operating environment, it's not off the rails. We should if we, right, if we have a bunch of resources and we have a bunch of time and we're, we're not doing anything else, yeah, we can investigate it. But if we have a bunch of different priorities, let's put this one lower down. And for me, bringing this all together, the idea of taking different techniques and different algorithms in a really uncertain environment helps give stakeholders and decision makers different perspectives, which they can use and combine with their intuition or what they know about their, their past experience in their environment to come to, a, hopefully, uh, a conclusion that is closer to reality and the truth. I think if you look at it um, on a granular level, the problem runs deeper than this. For example, after 2008 financial crisis, the market went like nosedive, and there was absolutely no model that could actually predict that. And if you talk about this um, same scenario with COVID-19, um, I seriously doubt that there would be any indicators that you know that would be actually able to help predict the news dive that's going to happen um, after and the news broke out. Uh, so, for example, if I do use weighted averages, even weighted averages wouldn't be able to help you uh, with um, any predictions um, or red flags that things are going to happen. What are you doing in these scenarios, which is once in a blue moon, but still, you know, it can take a huge hit. Um, do you do some kind of damage control uh, once you see um, the weekly or monthly variances uh, or even daily variances in sales or supplies or news? I mean, do you also have some kind of sentiment analysis that goes with um, the um, structured data analysis? Well, so I'd say uh, two things. So on the data side, you got to figure, we're going to assume these are unpredictable events or relatively unpredictable events. So we're talking about what happens afterwards, either immediately or a week to or a month afterwards. Uh, on the data side, 
you want to identify that as an anomaly. And if you have different time series models that you're using for forecasting, figure out what is the more appropriate replacement number, right? So we have to impute that, that outlier data and put a number in there that we think is more quote unquote reasonable. Again, a little bit of art here, but more reasonable so that our model as we're making predictions into the future doesn't say, oh, I think these outlier events are gonna happen over and over. So that's one. So it's a bit of a parameter tuning there. Uh, on the, the, you mentioned damage control side, I think it is a matter of parties and partners coming together and making sure that communication is flowing. So sometimes it ends up where you have to have multiple intraday calls or you have to have daily calls, but there is there, there comes a point when you're trying to get back to an equilibrium level. If there's a lot of different agents in, in supply chain, right? We have a lot of different people, not only uh, a retailer or a manufacturer, but you have the carriers, you have different third-party logistics companies that you have to coordinate with uh, and communication becomes, becomes optimal, right? The truth is you're probably not gonna make, unless you're really lucky, you're probably not gonna make the, uh, the best decision the first time. So the best bet you have is to try something. So rather than stand around the wait, you should try something, make sure that you're measuring or have some ability to measure the, the impact. And then as, as, it, as you see the impact occurring, try to readjust. I mean, that's a good thing that you come from an economics background. So we can talk about the, um, this outside the data realm, which is yeah. uh, in the situation of COVID-19, um, using microeconomics and macroeconomics, a larger uh, supply and demand um, patterns. How would you predict, let's put it in a concrete example. How would you, would you possibly could have predict um, that the demand for toilet paper is going to skyrocket um, in a, a situation where people are trying to hoard um, this one product, but all of others are going down, uh, especially with staples that might go up uh, with more cosmetics are probably going down uh, with a lot of outdoor equipment that's probably going to go down. So is, that a mo is there a model that comes from common sense and economics also, and not only the uh, historic data that you have? No. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, what a, what a great question. Um, so typically the, the way I try to think about these and as the afternoon goes by uh, later on today, I'll, I'll probably be thinking about this one, but I think it's important to as best as possible, have different mental models to try to think through these problems as they come up. Uh, some of the most common mental models that, that I try to make sure my team and my teammates are, are very familiar with, and when we were trying to problem solve, they have them at hand is the Pareto principle or the 80-20 rule. Opportunity cost is a big one. Uh, inverse thinking is it becomes a, a really interesting tool when you're stuck. If you're trying to solve a problem, instead of asking, how do we solve this problem? You would ask, how can we make this problem worse? And by inversing the way you're thinking about it, you can list out how to make that problem worse and then do the opposite of those things. So while I don't have a direct answer to your question, uh, there are a lot of different ways you can think. A lot of, there's a bunch of mental models that come out of economics, particularly opportunity cost. Uh, but then Shane Parrish and Farnham Street, they do, they have this website where they have a huge long list of different mental models from all different disciplines that you can use to think through problems. And if you have exposure to those ways of thinking, you're more, I think, more likely to come up with a better solution, uh, even if I can't do it within a five second window here. I think um, it, it's a very good opportunity because we've been working on this uh, for quite some time and I've um, talked to, uh, to um, a good friend of mine on his podcast where I was invited uh, that you know even before we have the data and we're going to make our forecast and predictions we can probably take some um, ancient folk wisdom from economics um, that's around us and, and do some kind of damage control. For example, that happens all the time in stock markets. So why is that when inflation rate goes up, people hoard up on gold instead of um, stocks and other um, items? Why do people um, want to have um, appreciable assets and not depreciable assets? And there are like 
um, seven or eight bigger commodities that people use at the home, tea, sugar, and things like that. And these prices can in some way correlate with um, what's going to happen. And if, if, you're, if, if the prices go up, it's more likely that people are trying to hoard that. And that might be a good red flag indicator uh, for um, the other supply chains also. I mean, all the items in Target or Walmart or Amazon or anything that's correlating with the perishable items. But that's certainly one area that, you know, um, I'd be more than happy open to discuss um, how um, it, it can be beneficial and probably we can create a model about that also. But one of the things that I wanted to ask you is that how is that that um, the, these models, I mean, how do you create an alert system uh, and how frequent that is that, you know, something is wrong? The anomaly detection module, how do you set it up so that it gives you the threshold for the uh, damage control or inventory levels or anything, some kind of um, synergetic system that is intertwined with each other um, that helps you make decisions in, 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 in right time? Yeah, so, I, I, so first of all, if you're going to set up that model, it's probably good to understand what you would do even if you had the information afterwards. Right. So in the toilet paper example, uh, if you can see that coming, are you going to raise the price of toilet paper? I think there's plenty of examples even throughout the past two decades where that is unethical to do. Right. Because people need toilet paper. And we could argue that point as well. But but um, I, I think for starters, even if you could identify it, what would you do with the information would be helpful. Um, but then in terms of how how you would approach it in the first place, there is, um, I think, a pretty big need anytime in, in the, particularly in the supply chain and logistics world, to prove out that the lead indicators that we believe are lead indicators are actually representative and lead indicators of the thing we think they are. Because a lot of the times we say, yeah, it makes total sense that if this number goes up, then this number is going to go up. But then you collect all the historical data and you can run maybe you can can ideally fit a causal model and try to prove it out that way. I think a lot of the times we don't prove those things out. We say, when this thing goes up, this thing will go up. So when this thing goes up 20%, let's, let's raise the price on toilet paper, right? Because then we can, can meter the demand over there. I think, uh, I think as the data science community has um, maybe even a responsibility to at least bring those things to attention that if we're going to say that there is a relationship or there is a link to go the extra mile and prove it out um, and at least confirm the intuition of the business or the stakeholders or find a way um, to, to communicate that it that the relationship cannot be found in the data. I'm not going to say that it doesn't exist, but we'll say it cannot be found in the data. Uh, well, there's absolutely no indication that, you know, they have sold uh, cheaper toilet papers um, at economies of scale, especially with the statistic that we have 600 billion market thanks to COVID-19. Everyone is in profit. Target is making out like a bandit. Um, Amazon sales are through the roof. Um, the same day fulfillment services grew 55% in the second quarter after 270% growth in the category um, a year ago. And the drive up targets name curbside pickup um, has been the star of the same day fulfillment during the pandemic with sales up more than 80% after 700% growth in the quarter a year ago, according to Amazon report. Now, how do you see this trend growing based on the data that you have? Um, or your expert opinion and knowing the markets for such a long time. Do you think this is going to persist? Um, Target has become so rational that they're paying college tuition fees for their employees. Um, you, I mean, you would have wished that, you know, you uh, were an employee back then when you were in college, but, you know, is that going to continue? So there's a, a few variables, depending upon how you're looking at this, that will that will shake out over the next year or two. Um, so number one, uh, all of the, the retailers in the country over the past two, two years, how did market share shake out, right? Whether it comes to Target or Walmart or Amazon, uh, did some of those players gain market share? Did they lose market share? Depends on the product category. Um, did some of those brick and mortar staple items are they now more sold uh online um so we'll have to see as things quote unquote normalize 
as things hopefully quote unquote normalize after the COVID pandemic, uh, where market share falls uh, between between different companies. Uh, the second part of that is there, um, and I don't take this with a grain of salt, but I think about uh, the, the government stimulus that we have pumped into the economy right now. You had mentioned that the, the retail sales numbers are through the roof. So there's a lot of money flowing around out there. Uh, if that money dries up, eventually, what does that mean in terms of uh, consumer spending? I don't think we know that yet. There, there are some predictions made, but I don't think we know exactly what's going to happen there. Uh, and then the other thing is services open up again and people start going out to restaurants and going and spending money on entertainment. Will that shift um, that we saw in 2020 from services over into consumer goods go back uh, in, from consumer goods into, um, into services? So there's a lot of variables over the next one to two years that we're not exactly sure what's going to happen. The one thing I think that that will remain intact is this move um, to online purchasing. So I think it, nearly every company out there that sells digitally uh, saw their uh, e-commerce sales grow at, at a huge rate in 2020 um, and it's into 2021. So I think we'll continue to see that happening. And then even companies that didn't have um, digital sales or didn't have digital uh, presence went to shopify.com and set up a, an online account and an online store and now they're online store. So I think the the e-commerce trend and the appetite for digital buying really caught fire in 20 and in 2020 and that will continue to grow. I think one of the benefits that companies reap from um, this situation is not only on the um, sales side, but also on the cutting um, expenditure side also, where the costs have gone down since the, the physical store uh, employees in some places have been reduced because of the online sales. Um, and that, that cost, redu cost reduction has also added um, to the um, bottom line. And I'm just wondering, do you as um, your role in your role help with the strategic decision uh, making also and giving s some of the insights on um, in, in this current circumstance, maybe you're looking for some kind of merger and acquisitions with other companies that might help in the sales. Um, a lot of companies are buying other companies. We've seen Salesforce and um, Slack uh, merger. And then you also have Zoom is trying to expand. You know, Facebook is uh, about to launch its uh, digital currency. Is that something that you do as part of your job also? Or um, is that something that um, you you notice, but it it, it, it just doesn't make your job. Um, you know, it, it doesn't make a. It's not a job description of yours. Yeah, so you could think of my my role as um, more operations analytics than anything else. So the goal of my data teams are to keep product moving. We want to make sure everything is moving as fluidly as possible. So those strategic decisions, I'm I'm just not privy to. Uh, the only thing that I do know is that. Uh, Target is a, an innovative place. Um, so in terms of right, if th those folks that are looking to be creative and try new things and see work at a place where um, it, <laughs> I, I almost want to say anything is possible, uh, working at Target is, is um, a, a great place to be. But to directly answer your question, I am not privy to that information. Oh, I understand. Um, there's a book that we both share our love for. Um, and I totally uh, fell in love with the blog post that you wrote about uh, Thomas Piketty's uh, capital in 21st century. Um, when you talk about the change point algorithms, uh, when I first read the book and um, then I heard him talk on um, in a conference on YouTube, you know, I, I, I thought that was one of the most remarkable contributions um, to economics. Uh, tell us your view about the book itself. And, and, you know, briefly, if you could also tell where do you actually lie on the economic spectrum, you're more of a free market guy or uh, more of a socialist uh, penchant uh, about you. And uh, let's talk a little bit about change point um, algorithms as well and how useful they are. Sure. Okay. So there's a lot in there. So I'd say, first of all, I, I, Historically, I've always leaned towards more of a, a free market um, perspective. Uh, someone once asked me if you could have dinner or lunch with any deceased 
person who would it be? And the first person that came to my mind was Milton Friedman, uh, the way he, right, the way he looked at data, but the way he communicated it, right, was always um, really, really impressive to me. Um, with that said, I have uh, friends who are on that other side of the economic spectrum, and we can talk all day long because it's so, for me, it's so fantastic to get that perspective, right? Sure, I have my own perspective. And honestly, I know I have my own biases. So to be able to listen to someone with a different perspective, and especially when it's polar opposite, I can have those conversations all day long because I think ultimately it makes me a better thinker. Um, in terms of Piketty's book, I, I the, the number one thing that I loved about it most was how often he reminded his readers, that the data that he has compiled is, they're all estimates, right? All of this economic information that governments around the world collect about their economies, it's not exact representation of the truth. Those are estimates, right? So I love the disclaimer that he continued to make about, hey, we need to look for differences that are orders of magnitude apart, because when they're orders of magnitude apart, then we can say the noise at each of these the, uh, the noise that in the data that is collected, um, we can say that the difference we're seeing is probably a real thing. So I love that he said that. And then ultimately the way he put it together where he is combining uh, the, the historical literature with this economic data that he's collected to say, when things get really, uh, so to specifically say, when any income inequality gets to a level that is so unbalanced in history, we see it over and over again, where uh, there is problems that arise from that. And there's probably second and third order consequences that we don't talk about every day. So it, it really gave me a great perspective and a better in-depth understanding of income inequality, not just uh, here where I live in the US, but around the world. I think um, let's come to change point afterwards, but that, that's a good um, you know, point in the context where we could talk about different models of economics, because you seem to be a person who have certainly thought about that a lot, and you've had a lot of conversations about this. And you know, during my study in Sweden, which is totally a socialistic um, um, opposite pole um, from the US, why do you think that you know, despite all its benefits of free market and capitalism, um, with a little help of going around, um, you know, looting uh, money with from the wars, why is that that um, the free market is not performing as well as the European societies in terms of productivity, in terms of um, uh, mental health, in terms of um, lifespans, in terms of healthcare, um, U.S. remains 34th or 33rd and when it comes to um, healthcare. Um, there is no universal health coverage. When it comes to education, it's probably 35th or something. And all of this scales, and it probably ranks the lowest in all developed countries. Despite its great achievement because of the scale, it doesn't rank up with the rest of them. So. Some might argue that you know socialist world has probably uh, taken over um, the free market um, debate by um, walking the talk. What do you say about that? Look, um, <laughs> one of one of my really good friends in the past would always call me out for being Switzerland. So he would always say, "Frank, you always." you're you're the the quintessential two-handed economist so yeah i always have an initial opinion but then i say on the other hand right we could go the other way on there um i i think there's there's no doubt that um in the us some things work well for us but there's a lot of things that do not work well and i think that works its way all the way it, that works its way all the way up to how our government operates and how we have a bunch of political leaders that Right, are divided 50-50 on every single thing and every single um, public debate that that exists today. So I I can't give a, a great strategic solve for for what you say. Um, what I can say is that to, to an extent, I understand that like th there is a lot of work to do and there is probably change that that needs to happen um and i think the economic perspective often gets lost so when i come into these conversations i the economic perspective is where i start 
and then I back into the rest of it. And I think a lot of folks start with um, on the other end of the spectrum. So they'll start with the, the social aspect of it there and then kind of forget about the, the economic aspect because most people are not trained economists uh, or have taken more than an econ 101 class. But I always start with the, the economic and financial perspective. So if we're thinking government spending, government programs, uh, inflation, right? That's where my mind always starts. So I start maybe whenever I, I have these conversations at a more timid space, right? I'm a little more risk averse. You know what? We should do a ton of government spending, but what is the implication? This goes back and forth, I feel like with every single paper I read, but does massive government spending lead to towards hyperinflation at some point in the future? I think yes. <laughs> people, I, right? I have an education and people have told me time and time again, right? Those are that's the relationship that we've seen in history. Um, but is there a way that right we can control for that better? Um, perhaps. And one of the interesting questions with this, if you were to remedy the situation um, here, um, what would be the ideal uh, reform that you would make? Uh, for example, I'm thinking of um, UBI. Um, if that's something that you would, you think that would actually ameliorate situation of the uh, people who are who definitely need that they're um, almost on the poverty line. You know, they they have it bad. Um, in comparison to others um, in the face of the opposite spectrum, which is the highest um, paid CEOs um, and tech companies, they barely pay any taxes um, and their combined income, their, their income is probably more than com combined income a lot of developing countries. So what would your solution be if you were to, uh, you know, take charge someday? Look, I, so would, would UPI be uh a solve for, for all of our problems? Maybe, I, I don't know. Uh, it makes sense to me. There are um, Good Economics for Bad Times is a book I read recently. And they talk about the, really the, the, the psychological impact to people when they're worried about paying their next bill or how are they gonna pay their next grocery bill, right? The, that's not an isolated problem for an individual. That, me that problem weighs on them mentally. So that means they probably can't perform at work or they can't perform at school. And right, so I believe there's a real relationship there. If they had a UBI and they could get that pressure off the back, would they be able to perform better in other facets of their community and their life? I tend to think yes. Uh, the folks like Jeff Bezos and, and Elon Musk, on one hand, I, I love what they're doing. I love that they're experimenting with stuff and trying new stuff and pushing industry to different levels. Um, at the, the same time, I think about anytime one entity has so much power through history, if you look at examples, that's not a good thing, right? So when power is consolidated like that, and I tend to think money is power, uh, the, the outcomes I, I don't think have been good. Um, and then the final thing that the final thought that comes to mind um, is more experimentation. So when I think about data science and supply chain, looping those back in, uh, one of the things that is, has been helpful for me is experimentation, right? Hey, I don't know the answer. I can't find the answer in the data. Why don't we experiment with something? I would love to see more experimentation. So I don't know how you, that would take probably a, a good amount of coordination, but is there a way to experiment um, in new ways, right? There's, there's probably been in some way, shapes or form basic income programs over time uh, that have been tried out, but I would like to see some kind of new experimentation. So if I was, uh, I think you said, if I was in charge, um, I would, I'd be running more experiments to try to learn more and um, see what works. All right, let's come back from macro to micro and uh, talk about some of your own experimentation with your career. Uh, I mean, we people um, who tend to be decision makers now, you know, we gratuitously uh, dish out advice to people without actually sometimes accepting that we have made blunders in our own careers. What would be some of your own experimentation and the points, um, critical decisions that you think, you know, I screwed up uh, at that moment. I mean, uh, you certainly have some advice um, which you are not, um, you know, mistakes that you have made yourself. 
Sure. So, uh, okay. So number one, I've been been building and leading data teams for uh, let's let's round it up to ten years now. Uh, I've hired a lot of analysts, and each interview that I go through, I think I come out of it with a good sense of what that analyst can do. Uh, and and most of the teams that I've built, I've had panels of interviewers. So it's not just been my opinion that counts, but the opinion of, let's say, three or four other people. And I always try to keep a mental history of how did that interview go? What was my sentiment coming out of there? And I think over the years, right, as those as those teams and as those candidates have either done really, really well or done not as great, I think I've been able to create some intuition for what I see in, in the interview in the early stages versus how things uh, versus the outcomes that that eventually happen, um, having having that history, I I've definitely made mistakes in hiring, um, and then learned from those mistakes. And ultimately, I think what that's led me to is indexing really heavily on behaviors. So a lot of the times, I think about uh, my analyst teams in terms of behaviors and outcomes. Right. So someone can can perform um, can p- perform well in terms of like running the models and cleaning the data, uh, but then the behaviors is a really big one. And I think the behaviors is the thing that really through those trials, um, through those trials and, and iterations of interviews and hiring and witnessing outcomes, it's really the behaviors that I look for these days in terms of, can someone be curious? Are there, do they have good examples of grit in their history? Um, do they demonstrate extreme ownership? I know it sounds crazy, but the idea of extreme ownership where someone shows up to a meeting and something went wrong and they say, you know what, that's my fault. I could have done this other 10 things to to help prevent this. And you're like, no, (laughs) there's no way that you could have done those other 10 things, but it's such a good attitude and it's so healthy for a team. So I think Right through those mistakes, I look at them as positives because I've been able to learn and, and ultimately get um, to where I am today. And I think hopefully I'm better at building the right teams today and doing it faster than I was five, six, seven years ago. Um, and then in terms of other other mistakes, um, definitely earlier on, but I still have the problem of jumping the gun a little bit. Right, if there's an exciting project and it seems like it's going to add a ton of value, yes, let's do that today, right? (laughs) Like uh, stakeholders often say, hey, I have this idea. Can we do it? Yes, let's do that without really considering the, um, I'll go back to opportunity cost, without considering the opportunity cost. There's a lot of stuff that we want to do today. There's a lot of stuff that seems value add, but if we do one thing, that means we can't do something else. So uh, that is something I've, I've learned, I've gotten better at, but I'm still working on. Yeah, well, generally it's a very good um, thing to be happy, go merry, but you know, it, it, if you have way too much, and you know, it's kind of asking uh, the bull to come and hit you. Uh, but uh, I was just wondering, do you also have some kind of a personality test? Because we certainly have a, um, psychometric tests uh, for hiring and recruitment before we um, hire people because we have experienced just exactly what you have that you know behavior is probably the number one thing and especially when you're hiring data scientists you know these are the kind of people who you would expect that they are thinking out of the box thinking on the edge of everything and that's exactly from my personality psychology and all yet that is exactly the area where you also have instability um, as well and behavioral problems because you cannot have it best of the both words. Um, so there has to be some compromise or let's say some maturation that has to happen. And I'm just wondering, do you, in your recruitment process, do you do you have some kind of psychometric testing that tells you about the profiles? Uh, you know, I, uh, in the past, I've definitely used some of that, but uh, today and in the, in the recent past, I haven't. And I don't have a good reason for why not, especially because I'm here saying that I index so heavily on behaviors. Um, it's just something that uh, haven't haven't used in the recent past. Yeah, because I, I had um, Ryan Sherman from um, Hogan's Assessment, which is the world's largest personality assessment um, company on my podcast. And we talked in detail about how wonderful that is. That it literally shoved down turnover um, to zero um, in most companies, because when you match personality types, 
with the job description. It, it certainly um, turns out to be better than the base um, line. So that might be something um, that you would want to look into. But let's um, come back to something that I promised you in the beginning of the interview. Uh, we're going to roast Target as well because of its epic failures. Uh, let's talk about Canada. Uh, it was an epic failure of what happened with Target in Canada. They had to shut down 133 stores. Uh, they moved into the market, according to the Harvard Business Review uh, article in 2015, um, a rushed entry um, because a lot of cross-border customers were coming to Target stores um, in U.S. So they thought that that would be a good opportunity to get the elite out of the Zeller stores. Uh, didn't turn out that way. And I was just wondering... Uh, didn't they have some kind of uh, strategic um, analytics department um, or you weren't in Target back then? <laughs> yeah, so uh, I I've, uh, came to Target about four years ago. Um, so I can't speak to what happened up in Canada, whether the, the decision was made to go in, what what was missed, and then the decision to, to come out. Um, I do know that Brian Cornell, who's been our leader, geez, I'm going to get this wrong, but for the past five, six, seven years, um, I do know that that when he came in and took tenure, uh, started leading Target in the direction that we've come to today and, and are achieving today, um, that was kind of the turning point where uh, the, the Canada thing started to slowly wind down, um, and then we set our sights on other things that have been incredibly fruitful, like ship from store and drive up and uh, and order pickup at our stores. I was also wondering, um, and I do realize that you know you don't do a lot of uh, strategic work, but now you see also the importance of how your um, job can create value for these uh, in, for you know furnishing information information for these strategic decisions as well. How do you plan to cope um, or or match? Um, the quality and service of your competitors, the bigger ones, Walmart and Amazon. So now they have Amazon has actually come into the grocery business also um, with very high tech um, staffless um, stores. Um, and, and what are the upcoming, you know, um, kind of uh, innovations in Target that would match with these bigger giants? Yeah, you know, I don't work terribly closely with, with the strategy teams today. Uh, what I do know is that when I got to Target early on, we had a leadership huddle and one of the guest speakers was Jim Collins. And most people know Jim Collins. He's published books on leaderships and companies that, that have grown and built something lasting. And Jim's philosophies, I think, permeate how Target operates today. Uh, one of those one of those philosophies is the 20 mile march, right? Target has to focus on what we do and what we do really well. And that's really servicing our guests and making sure that they have the best possible um, customer experience that, that they can. So whether that is making sure that we're collecting the right information about those guests and then fulfilling, getting them their, their product um, in a way that works for them and making sure they're, they're delighted every day and keeping your eye on that every single day and making sure that your partners, whether you're in merchandising, whether you're in finance, whether you're in supply chain, are all working towards that goal. I think in terms of the bigger picture strategy, Jim Collins has, has really um, either uh, officially or unofficially set the stage for us in, in how we act strategically. Mm -hmm. I think a, a lot of these strategies have been very successful if you look at the um, track record of um, Target and how it has actually been able to manage its um, position um, in fierce competition. But let's talk a little bit about your forecasting models and what do you actually use for that. Um, you've mentioned in your blog post about um, profit. Um, that's one of the tools that you use. Uh, what other tools do you actually use and what other variations uh, you um, actually apply on top of that, like Serial Max or um, Area Max for seasonality and variations? Um, uh, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, sure. So um, we, uh, so the, the profit models have been really useful at the aggregate level, even with the volatility that we've seen over the past two years. At that aggregate level, the amount of product that is being moved, um, the, the profit models capture the pattern pretty well. But 
when it comes down to, so the aggregate level is one level. When you go down to more granular levels, because um, there's a bunch of different flow paths in any supply chain. And when you go down to the more granular levels, you have less data. If you have less da data, those models don't work as well. Um, so trying to figure that out, uh, we try to take generally a top-down approach. Um, and I, well, let me say this. I, I, channel, I generally think of it as a top-down approach where if you can get the top forecast right, you can use some other methodologies at the lower level. So um, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of simulation models that aren't super complex and robust, but are good enough to get a general sense of where is the volume going to split. So if you can get the top level on the overall volume, and then at the granular level, try to understand what does the order patterns look like and then flow that out with the simulation model and have uncertainty within that simulation model. You can understand over the next few months what the volume is gonna look like flowing through your different nodes. Now, the modeling is one component of it and the forecast is one component of it. I find that the, the real win or the real value if you are any team that is forecasting is if you can make a distinction between a forecast and a plan. So a forecast um, and right in the data science world, we're very interested in the forecast component because you take historical data, you use statistical methodologies and you say, this is what we think volumes are gonna look like in these different flow paths over the next two, three, two, three weeks or two, three months, right? But when it comes down to a shorter timeline, we need to really be able to look at the capacity constraints we have uh, for instance, can we? How much product can we get through the LA Long Beach ports? And if we can't, if our forecast model says 100, but then the amount we can actually get through those ports in a one-week time period is 50, our forecast is our unconstrained model, but the plan or the thing we're committing to should only be 50, right? And then we have to marry those two things up. So it, it it's a little bit painful for forecasting teams when the plan is lower than your forecast. And then people point back and say, hey, but your forecast is wrong. And we say, well, yeah, I know. Our, our forecast is an unconstrained statistical model. We need to create a plan and a commitment. And that's what we were executing to. So when the plan, the commitment is wrong, like that's what we should be bridging accuracy to. And I find that teams that can break that distinction between forecast and a plan um, and then operate around that and revise and learn by understanding where the plan has broken down, do really well uh, working together. Um, I also assume there must be nonlinear patterns um, in the data that you have. Um, and the most common practice now is to use uh, deep neural networks um, on humongous data to find out these nonlinear patterns. Um, but one of the problems um, which might be of utmost concern uh, in your position is the interpretability and explainability of the models, which is a huge problem with deep neural networks. So do you at all use any deep neural networks? Um, and if you do, how do you take care of the explainability problem? Uh, honestly, I use zero deep neural networks today. Good choice. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I have a friend, his name is Ralph Asher. He turned me on to Monte Carlo's uh, a few years ago. And I love, I think Monte Carlo's work really well because you can explain them. Uh, although they, they sometimes become computationally expensive, I find it very easy to explain to stakeholders how they are working, where you take a sequence of events, you take distributions of those events, and then you feed it through, especially when they are nonlinear, because uh, particularly in the transportation or supply chain world, the transits are, you very rarely have a normal distribution, right? You always usually have a long tail because there's a bunch of stuff that arrives late. Um, so you have these, these nonlinear relationships. So I, I find that those models work well because I can communicate the outputs, I can communicate the assumptions, uh, and they can give you a, a range of uncertainty um, for what you're looking at. I'm glad that you actually brought this long tail um, question because that happens um, a lot in time series. And one of the solutions, um, at least in the normal machine learning algorithm is to draw, uh, do the um, 
to eliminate the outliers, but that certainly isn't um, a choice um, in the time series data. And the problem is that do you do you also use some kind of uh, model parsimony for in neural networks? What you would do is that you would do uh, some kind of regularization L1, L2. But what do you do? Um, in the models that you use to make sure that your model is as simple, as explainable, explainable and as small um, as it can be? Start with super basics, right? A everything we do, uh, I'm always starting with, and if, so my preference is that I can start in a spreadsheet and I can build a tiny toy model to represent how I'm thinking about stuff. So I often refer to a spreadsheet as the whiteboard of data analysis, because if I can start there and I can build a very small model and try to represent my ideas there, then I could go to a script and I can start building out uh, a more, more complicated model. And even if I get to a more complicated model, and even if my output ends there, I can always start with that, uh, that explanation piece in the spreadsheet. Everyone's very, I mean, anyone we work with is very comfortable with a spreadsheet. And if I can change those, those assumptions or those parameters in the spreadsheet, the stakeholders become comfortable with the output of the more complicated thing because they understand the representation of what we're trying to do. And very early in my career, I found that this was probably the most powerful technique out of anything I've used. Uh, I had started building all my pricing models in Excel and laid out all my assumptions all my customers were able to see that. And because they were able to see all the assumptions and they were able to change things in real time, they were more often than not comfortable with the pricing structure because they understood how the model was working and said, okay, your model makes sense. Your assumptions make sense. The, the pricing makes sense to me. And that was a lesson I learned early on in my career. And I still use it today. So while a lot of people are right, bash, on, bash on Excel, bash on spreadsheets in the data science world, I think it's an awesome starting point to really uh, make sure that the way you are thinking about it in your head, in your mind, can be communicated uh, when you finally have the more complex, typically harder to explain model. But just wondering, how do you actually, and I'm assuming you have petabytes size data, how do you actually do that in Excel? I thought you would be using something called Spy, PySpark or you know, some kind of other um, tool that would be able to deal with larger data sets. Sure. So no, the, the Excel part is always just a representation, right? I think the numbers will work like this together. And then you, f you figure out the relationship uh, of, the, of the numbers. And I usually use fake data, right? So I'll, I'll make my own fake data in that setting. But then, yeah, once the data scales up, of course, you're, you're using, um, I, in, in my world, typically PySpark to process that kind of stuff. Yeah, but wouldn't you want to... Um keep the um, distribution the same as in actual data? I mean, why would you create fake data and make distributions which wouldn't have no resemblance with the actual data? Wouldn't it give misleading results? Uh, so I think that's a great point, but I also think it is um, helpful to check whether the distribution that, right, if I'm thinking about it, I'm thinking the distribution looks a certain way. To me, that's another check on um, how how you're formulating the problem. And I think the distributions look like this. And then when you start fitting them using your, your scripts and validating your initial thought process, I think that's actually becomes more powerful in a second check on how you first formulated the problem. I think you might be able to uh, make a crone job or a pipeline for you know extracting uh, a part of the data which matches the um, distribution of the bigger data and then you know automatically feed that to excel and make some kind of template or macro that would automate the job for you or do you do it manually all the time uh i don't do it manually all the time uh, there you go there's... you have a tip now <laughs> <laughs> yes Great. So what are the tools you generally, I mean, you wrote about that um, and in your previous jobs um, at Wayfair um, and other companies, you have used both um, R and Python, which is a perennial uh, battle uh, among the data science community. Um, and I was just wondering, how do you use both of them uh, at the same time? Are there specific use cases for each of them? For example, I personally really like um, our shiny dashboards. Um, you just have to click one button and it deploys um, to the cloud uh, mm -hmm. versus Python. You have to do a lot of, you know, back-end and front-end engineering um, or an external um, app deployer and then 
do the load balancing, a lot of other things. Um, and I was just wondering, how do you use both of them? And are like, what what would be a better situation for um, R and in other situations, Python would be better? Yeah, sure. So my opinion, uh, and I try to get my I try to get my team on the same page here, uh, but sometimes people have extensive experience in 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 a different path. Uh, but the way I try to approach is that if I am doing uh, basically data frames and visualization, I'm probably going to reach out for R, because I love the way that with relatively low amount of, of coding, you can create some really powerful visualizations in all kinds of ways. Um, I feel like if you're using pandas in Python, your equivalent is gonna be a, a notebook long worth of code, right? It's just, just to get a, a matplotlib or a seaborne visualization. Um, again, just in my experience. So if, if I'm trying to aggregate data frames or build visualizations, I'm usually opening our studio. Um, but then for, I find if I'm trying to work with an API or trying to create data in some some way, I'm more likely to go and, and open a Python notebook for that. So um, one of the examples is I was looking for the, the geo locations of all the ports around the, the world a few weeks ago, and I couldn't find it in a CSV file, all, all nicely formatted the way I wanted it, but I found um, a GeoJSON file. And I thought, oh, Perfect, GeoJSON file, I'll take that. So I just um, wrote that into a, a Python notebook real quick, converted it into a nice data frame and then export it as a CSV. So I find if I am if I have to do these, these things where um, I'm moving data around, I'm probably gonna reach for Python. If I'm trying to aggregate data frames and, and visualizations, I'm reaching for R. Um, I think one of the problems with people like us, um, I and I assume that's with you also, that you know it's really hard to delegate um, things to <laughs> staff because you don't know how they have cleaned the data. I mean, what columns they have dropped out. Um, if, for example, what kind of coding they use? Is it one hot encoding? Is it a hot and cold deck? And that kind of, you know, sows the seed of uh, skepticism um, and, you know, that might actually impact the resulting model. So how do you deal with this problem where you have so much time um, and you have to deal with a lot of other problems, not only the um, engineering part and the machine learning part of that, but also the um, presentation and business side of that. How do you manage this problem where you have to supervise junior data scientists to clean the data? Because 80% of data science, frankly, is data cleaning. Sure, so uh, I'm definitely a, a leader and that leads by example. So generally my philosophy is, I'm gonna make sure that I'm familiar with, with how this work is happening. Uh, it does help that I have a huge passion for it, right? So on the on the nights and weekends, I'm still doing this stuff just because I Well, the I love question it. is not your passion, but the time that you have. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But um, it, it, the truth is a lot of the stuff I, I can't do, but it does allow me to, uh, when I can, I can sit down for code reviews with my junior data analysts. Um, but usually I have my, my lead data analysts who are sitting down with the junior analysts to do code reviews. But when I sit down in a room to do a code review, I'm not just a bystander sitting in the back saying, are they following protocol? I can actually look at the code and, and read down with them and understand their explanations and what they're actually doing. So I think it allows those sessions to probably go a little bit faster. Um, in terms of the trust, right, are, are my, my junior analysts writing good code and doing it in a way that um, I think is is the most efficient. I think that goes back to the recruiting process. Um, if I'm hiring the right team, right, I'm bringing people in that are, heck, everyone's going to make mistakes, right? But if we can work as a team and make sure we're communicating, I'm going to make sure that the my, my lead analysts are working well with the junior analysts, um, and then I'll, I'll step in ad hocly here and there when I can. Um, but if you don't have that culture of trust, uh, to me, that is incredibly draining as a leader and manager. Yeah, I guess you don't want to, you know, um, be um, catching the ball instead of you know, focusing on the work um, that has to be done. But one of the things that I wanted to ask you, especially um, with the enormity of the data and both the operations um, that you deal with, um, the perennial problem with 
machine learning models is the size of them. So big O notation um, for the um, this time and um, space complexity uh, of the models is a huge factor um, that decides if the model will go to production or not. Uh, to give you an example, uh, the Netflix uh, recommendation competition, the model that won the first prize never went into production because it was too big and too um, compute, um, co um, uh, pricey for the uh, production. So they took the second best model and they put it into the production. Um, and I was just wondering, you certainly have this problem. Um, you should have faced that problem um, working at Target where you have to deploy huge models um, and see their accuracy. And so how do you tackle with this? I mean, even though you would have a nice infrastructure for that, but then you still, you want to minimize um, the compute um, cost of the models. Yeah, so number one, most of our, our machine learning work uh, is, I, not with that scale of data that I'm terribly worried about that problem. And a lot of the machine learning work that we're doing is more explanatory than it is predictive of the future. So that, that's number one. Number two is we have a machine learning service. So if we want to set that stuff up, we have an infrastructure team that will, um, that, that we can use their service and we don't have to we should still worry <laughs> about how they run, but but effectively uh, they do a lot of that worrying for us. Um, you said that you know a lot of your work deals with explanation um, and not predicting. So what do you use the profit for if you're not forecasting? Uh, a, a bit. So <laughs> for. I mean, for there could the, be different domains, I guess. Yeah, a little bit, uh, but I mean, I'm thinking about um, so the the machine learning stuff that uh, historically I've been using it for. Why are things arriving late, or why do things go slower than we would expect? Uh, and then it, with the the profit models and the forecasting stuff, yes, we are predicting forward uh, forward looking volume arrivals. Okay, first thing. And also I was just wondering, um, you wrote a wonderful post about um, narrating the story behind the data um, or which one comes first, a bit of a um, chicken and a egg problem. And I was just wondering, do you also narrate stories at the level which includes um, a global or international relations perspective? For example, if you're receiving shipment late or you know some of the products have to be sourced from somewhere else because of a uh, political embargo, uh, for example, now there's a um, huge tension between China and um, US uh, on different product um, tariffs. Uh, it was a bigger issue in Trump's um, administration, but it can still always be a problem. So does that also um, reflect itself in data? And that's something that um, you flag your uh, senior management about? Yeah, so sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. Right. You can start with a narrative and you can start with a story, but there's often times when the, the data doesn't represent that narrative or story. So while I did write about, I, I think it is powerful to start with uh, a narrative um, and then back into the data. And I know in data science that is, I, I've said this before, but that's counter to how we approach these problems. Um, but working in a environment where a big part of your job is convincing other folks that we should go in a certain direction, I, I believe sometimes it is necessary. But if your data is is showing you nothing, manipulating your data in a way that, that supports your narrative um, is, is probably uh, not a good approach and probably a little bit unethical there. Um, yeah, but I, I mean, the, the premise is that starting with your narrative is almost like starting with a hypothesis, right? And then you want to prove out your hypothesis. If like your p-value is, is too high and you can't reject your null, then um, you, you're effectively not going to move forward, right? Yeah, I guess, I mean, if you're kind of data scientist who manipulate data to fit narratives, you know, a better place for you would be in a journalism. Um, but let's talk about something else. Um, one of the things that I really, really admire about your work is um, you're not kind of uh, 
the um, orthodox, uh, straight thinking engineer who fixate on one thing. You have different um, passions. You are a very well read man, a man who is inspired by Hans Rosling, Nate Silver, and Nassim Talib. Um, and I'm just wondering who's your inspiration um, when it comes to um, a lot of uh, the economics that you have learned, um, uh, analytics, or in general in life? I mean, what inspired you? to be um, who you are? There are, <laughs> so there are a lot of individuals that I could talk about. Uh, like I had mentioned before in, in university, I had some great coaches and great mentors there and they kind of propelled me into a, a lifelong state of curiosity, I think. Um, but some of the earliest folks I can remember reading that uh, right, those are, there, there were those books that you read and you thought, oh my gosh, how did I not know these secrets before? Um, I think that uh, Nate Silver's book that I can't remember off the top of my head, um, but, but his book and talking about probabilistic thinking was one of those that pivoted my path forward. Uh, and then I'd say the podcast from Russ Roberts, Econ Talk was another one that that pivoted my path forward. So I'd say, right, those two folks in combination with um, the Udacity courses that I took, I, I took uh, Udacity's data analyst nano degree and going through the process of building a predictive model and doing feature engineering, I think is such a, a healthy practice for anyone to go through. Because once you start doing that and practicing that, then you're thinking about a problem and trying to predict something forward. And if you try to understand the components that are driving that, you can do that not just in data analysis, but you start to do it with everything in your life, right? And you start to break problems into components and you start to understand if I do this, what is the, what is the impact on the outcome variable? So I, I'd say those, those three things uh, stand out as, as clear examples in my mind of, of either people or organizations that really changed the path for me. I think it's a very shrewd um, observation that you know understanding the drive behind things kind of takes you a long way. Um, I don't know if you have uh, read the book by Nassim Taleb, Skin in the Game, um, and it, it's a it, it's a very interesting oh, yeah. one where he talks about you know actually having um, some stake in the game. And it, do you often feel yourself that you know you talk about ownership, uh, which kind of uh, hints into the fact that you know you want to have some to have some loss and embarrassment out of a failure um, to get you motivated? Yeah, uh, I, so I, I try to um, have as much humility as possible. Uh, if you're familiar with, with Marshall Goldsmith, he has this practice that, that he invented or he made famous a long time ago called daily questions. And for the past few years, I've gone through this pr practice of daily questions. So I have a list of different behaviors that I'm trying to work on that help me achieve a goal in the long run. At the end of every single day, I go through that list and say, did I try my best to be grateful? Or did I try my best to read for 30 minutes? And I go through that list. And then over a two to three week period, I can start to say, oh no, this row is all zeros. <laughs> and then I can, and, and when I first started doing that, I was actually working with a leadership coach. I formed the habit and now I just do it myself. And it's such a healthy thing where I can look at where I, I'm failing myself. And then I say, okay, you got to pivot. You got to do something different or you got to double down and just grind through it if you really want this as, as an outcome. Um, and then being able to, to use those kinds of tools to change my behaviors has been absolutely fantastic. I think data science can be quite a um, addictive whirlpool uh, that you can easily get sucked into um, losing all kind of work life balance. How does it actually affect your personal life, you know, with your children and uh, your family? Because, you know, that's probably the most common complaint that, um, you know, wives have that, you know, data scientists have absolutely no interest <laughs> in the household work. You know, they often, you know, forget to take out the garbage. <laughs> You know, it's, uh, so data science and probably academics, and there, there's probably a few other uh, types of professionals who fit into this category. But once you have a problem on your mind, it's really hard for your mind to think about anything else, right? So you're in the backyard trying to play with your kids and you're trying to solve that problem in the back of your mind. Um, for me, one of the, the things um, that I've made sure is part of that daily practice exercise is to have family centric objectives in there. And when I first started doing that, I thought, man, this is this is fake. I'm faking it. But someone pointed out to me that um, it was very simple. They said, you are who you be, meaning that the behaviors that you demonstrate over time 
will help you become who you want to be. So in my daily questions, I always make sure I have something like teach my kids something new, teach my kids how to read, uh, pay attention to something that my daughter is saying. And at the end of every day, I make sure I do a mental check-in. Hey, am I too distracted with, with data science or my work or anything else that's going on to listen to my family? Because I know over time, if I look back in 20 years and I think, oh, great, I was totally distracted by those math problems and not paying attention to my kids as they grew up. All right, I, I have, I think, the, the wisdom and the foresight now to know that I will be disappointed with that. So I try to incorporate that into my, my daily behaviors. And ultimately, um, I hope, I hope I'm already there, right? You are who you be. I hope that's who I am already. Uh, but if not every single day, I get 1% better at it. And, uh, over time I will, I will be who I want to be. Yeah, I guess it's always a work in progress. And, you know, the only thing that you can do is, you know, keep um, pushing it forward. And I'm just wondering, um, who, who do you listen to, um, like podcasts uh, or books um, and you're a regular subscriber to? I mean, for example, I really like um, some of the um, tweets and podcasts by Naval Ravikant. I don't know if you're familiar with him. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, he, you should be, actually. He was on the Joe Rogan show. And um, the Jordan Peterson, Joe Rogan show itself. Um, sure. What do you like? Uh, so the two that, that jump to the top of my mind uh, are The Knowledge Project by Shane Parrish, which is a lot about leadership and decision making. Uh, and then the other one that I'm addicted to right now is called Learning Bayesian Statistics. And it is a podcast dedicated to folks that are, are doing Bayesian analysis and Bayesian statistics. Those are, are definitely my, my top two right now. I mean, you um, probably like, uh, I don't know if you've already read that, um, um, Slow and Fast Thinking by Daniel Kahneman. I'm going to be mean, honest. Uh, and I'm, I, every time somebody <laughs> asks me, I'm terribly embarrassed. I have it on my bookshelf upstairs. I have noise upstairs, but I haven't read it. Um, and it's one of those things that there's, you can't listen to a podcast or, or I feel like anything right now without hearing Kahneman's name mentioned and the work of fast and slow. So I'm kind of on the fence. Do I want to spend time, right, the, the, the two to four weeks reading the book? Uh, or do I already have everything that I need to know locked in because I've heard about it so many times? <laughs> but uh, it will be on one of my summer reading lists in the near future. We well, will probably start with his um, YouTube um, talks also and he's quite a prolific speaker as well but the reason why i wanted to ask the question is, is what do you categorize yourself um, as in a, a slow or a fast thinker i am absolutely a slow thinker <laughs> <laughs> so it's like deep or wide thinking yeah um for sure there's a I, it, it was always right speaking of things that embarrass me my my slow thinking was always something that was embarrassing to me until I read Derek Sivers and he, he came out with a book not long ago based upon a bunch of his blog posts um, called hell yes or no, or hell yeah or no. And uh, one of his, his posts in there was about how he is a slow thinker and how when he goes on to podcasts or when he goes into any conversation, he always tries to do get questions in advance because he knows that his first answer is never his, his best answer because he is a slow thinker. And as I read that, it just made me so much more comfortable with myself because the reality is I'm, <laughs> I'm not the I'm only oddball. <laughs> as, you know, a friend of mine, you know, we um, we have a common friend who is very intelligent and another friend of mine and we grew up together and you know, he became very successful in life. Another friend, I swear to God, if you had asked me when we were children about that guy, I would have said that he has some kind of Down syndrome or something because he's so slow in responding. And, you know, I thought, you know, that this is probably a good um perception of how people perceive people who are slow thinkers but this certainly has uh, it's all benefits also that you know you don't speak unless you're um, sure about something kind of a melancholic uh, personality type also uh, just wondering are you familiar with the four temperaments no no <laughs> that's an interesting thing also that they are kind of um uh, in the general characterization of um, people into four uh, different temperaments and uh, choleric sanguine phlegmatic um, and melancholic is used widely in uh, Christian counseling as well. And it used to be the Greek uh, medicinal temperaments as well. It's a certainly an interesting thing that you look into. I, I just read about that. I just can't remember the book. 
you're going to have me going on. I'm going to go upstairs and look at, at the books I've read recently and, and refine it. Yeah, it's pretty famous. You'll find it somewhere. Um, Frank, um, I've had a ball talking to you. Uh, it was such a fascinating conversation. And I don't think I've had a guest before talk about economics um, so deeply, um, which certainly seems to be my passion as well. Um, you certainly are <laughs> very gifted when it comes to um, both the analytical side of things um, and the social side of things. Um, and um, certainly uh, we'd we'll have this conversation um, in future also. Thank you so much for being here. Naj, I really appreciate it. Uh, your curiosity and the way you ask questions and dig is uh, uh, thrilling for me. So thank you again for the discussion. All right.